I appreciate your attendance. I'm Dave Chenoweth, and I have the honor and the privilege of presenting today on some cost techniques and tools on physical inactivity. How many of you are familiar with any type of techniques or online calculators regarding physical inactivity? Anyone? I'm talking to the right audience in. That's great. What we really have now is with today's technology and with a lot of the research that we've been able to capitalize over the last 20 or 30 years, what I want to do today is highlight some things that I think is going to be relatively new, but also is public access. That's what I'm excited about, because a lot of this stuff, you know, in the past was proprietary. You had to go to the database or had to spend a lot of money. But I, but I along with Dr. Walter Bortz, who's right here, it's a treat to see this man, because he and I were, were principally involved with one of the things I want to highlight today. But this is the agenda. I want to look at some ways, kind of like the who, what, where, when. Why are we looking at inactivity? What kind of tools are out there? What kind of techniques that can be used by practitioners? People in the wellness field, whether you're a trainer, whether you're a wellness program director, whether you're a broker or a consultant, whatever role you have, if you have an audience and you want to look at a population to try to quantify the economic cost, the financial cost, Today's focus is going to be on one technique and two tools, three, three modes. I want to highlight these types of things today, and I want to carve out, kind of set the stage for the first half hour, but really then spend the rest of the time showcasing two tools that are in the public domain now that you can readily available 24-7, which I'm excited about because they always haven't always been that way. What's the reasons for costing inactivity? Well, you could probably can put your own personal reasons. It's, it's a good thing right off the bat to be able to have something where you can understand the magnitude of inactivity because there's all kinds of estimates out there. We know the cost of obesity, but a lot of, a lot of the research in inactivity literally took place before obesity's research, but it wasn't as well publicized. But now we have a lot of data behind these tools, okay? The other thing is that when you look at building a case, now you have some cost data to build the case to say, I want to put in that policy or program or incentive. Why should you do that? Well, look at the numbers. Very conservative numbers are very, very uh, significant in the, in the broad scheme of things. The other thing is that you can compare one of these tools will actually look at 15 risk factors, including inactivity, so you can compare inactivity with other risk factors, okay? And lastly, you can look at doing some benchmarking, okay? You can look at things past, present, and future because a couple of these techniques I'll share with you today give you that opportunity to look at things now but also to project forward. The articles on inactivity and costing are really nothing new. These are just some recent ones that were basically published in peer-reviewed journal articles that through the work of a lot of researchers over the years kind of came to a capstone and you can see that these things literally go back, the cost accounting goes back literally a couple decades. This is nothing new. What is new is the readily available tools and techniques for people in positions like yourself. That's what's new, that's what's exciting. I've had the good fortune of, of doing a lot of work with a lot of states, about nine states to be exact, some of them more often than not. And as a result of that, you can literally see that those states are some of the most populated states in the country. Collectively, they represent about 90 million adults. 90 million adults. There's about 250 million adults in the United States right now. So that's about a third. And so we have good claims data and a little, uh, good cost data that we've been generating over the years. And so a lot of the work in the database that's used for these tools comes from that research, comes from those. And you can see that's pretty representative from literally from Maine to California, Washington State to Florida. You can't get any broader unless you include obviously the states of Hawaii and Alaska. And I haven't done any work with them, unfortunately. But nonetheless, I think you'll find that that's pretty representative when you look at states in just about every, 
geographic region. Now, the key factors to consider in looking at tools, obviously, I'm not going to read through these, but you want something that's representative. You want something that basically has a database that represents the population that you're going to focus. So if you're looking at a community or a city or a county, you want some public data on that, don't you? Okay. If you're looking at senior citizens, you would like to have some data on senior citizens. If you're looking at employees in a business setting, you would like for that data to involve employee claims and costs, not, not children's, okay, not pediatric costs, but adult costs. You also want those things to be validated. And so anything that's out there, you don't want it to be too proprietary because that suggests right off the bat somebody basically is going to charge for you to access it and they have something to hide or maybe they just want to basically generate something for their business solely. Neither one of these tools or techniques that I'm highlighting today is basically proprietary any longer. They're trademarked, but they're no longer proprietary. They're in a public domain format, okay? They're readily available. The other thing is that when you think about how many people are in that database that that model, that, that tool or technique is based on, 100, 100,000, 50 million, 5,000, okay? And not only that, but also are these tools capable of other things beyond just generating the cost, okay? Because you can go online and now you can find the cost of a lot of risk factors. Alcoholism, asthma, obesity, okay, hypertension. And they're really good about quantifying the cost. And a couple of them, including the diabetes calculators, will give you a cost outcome or a cost savings if you make this kind of impact. But there's very few of them out there that do all of that okay, on a different types of populations. Now, the metrics, the types of things that we see typically that are used first and foremost is medical care costs, don't you? See, the medical care cost of inactivity. Probably half of the published articles that you'll find is going to focus on medical conditions, okay? And then a handful of those, until the last 10 years, through that 90s, there wasn't a lot on lost productivity. Absenteeism, presenteeism, short-term disability. But kick in the 21st century since 2000, there's now been about 50 peer-reviewed journal articles linking inactivity to different rates of absenteeism, presenteeism, and short-term disability. Okay? And then thirdly, a handful of analysis, including some of my own, was required to focus on workers' comp. But that's not that common because workers' comp is not really well established, as well established as some of the medical conditions, or in terms of as, as well established as absenteeism or presenteeism or short term. But there's some good data out there on workers' comp that's evolving, okay? But those are the types of metrics, okay, that are typically used in a, some type of cost or financial cost equation, are those three. Now, some of you, if any of you are into epidemiology, you probably have heard of PAR, Population Attributable Risk. Epidemiologists and public health advocates use that to be able to study and kind of analyze what portion of a population could avoid that disease or that condition if they did a certain behavior, like become physically active, okay? And some of the analyses that you'll read in the, in the, in the peer-reviewed journal articles will focus on PAR, okay? I'm not going to, I'm not going to highlight uh, anything in particular because there's a lot of different techniques out there. PAR is one, and it's a real good technique if you're looking at trying to build some algorithms or logarithms. But I'm not here to, to, uh, to focus on that side today. I really, really want to kind of show you a couple tools and techniques that you can use, because I think you really are, being practitioners as you are, you want a tool that you can use on the spot, readily available, that's going to give you good, clear-cut, objective, unbiased outcomes. Now, the one thing we have to look at, any type of cost analysis, we know that a lot of medical care conditions are not just due to genetics or the environment or 
health care maladies or problems, but they're, a lot of them are due to lifestyle, okay? And so a lot of the, the cost analyses have to be very, very careful to be able to pull out those things that are potentially modifiable, that are related to inactivity. Because everything's not related to whether you're physically active or not. We know that genetics plays a big role in a lot of these conditions, don't we? We know that the environment, the access to a park or not, access to a fitness facility, access to having enough money to buy resources that you can become physically active if you want to, okay? So the other thing is health care. We know that people that are given a prescription medication for, for many medical conditions don't take it. And we have a lot of issues with that or a misdiagnosis, okay? So there's a lot of factors. So how do we decide on what types of conditions should be attributed and factored into a cost analysis? Because it's a challenge when you look at all those factors that affect human status or health status, much less are related to uh, physical inactivity. Back in 1995, the Surgeon General's report on physical activity was the first big government report that basically started to look at the relationship between a lot of medical conditions and physically inactive populations. Started back in 95, and since then we've obviously had a number of other reports, haven't we? Subsequent reports. These are a number of conditions that were identified and have since been identified by not only the Surgeon General, General's report, but also by the American Heart Association, ACSM and American Heart Association principally worked very carefully on a lot of research to establish the link between certain types of conditions and inactivity. So AC ACSM has been a leader in this field along with other organizations. What you see listed here are two categories, DRG and ICD. DRGs are diagnostic related groups. Those are the codes for those conditions that you see listed in the middle that have been firmly established as having a direct link to physical inactivity. The ICD, the right hand, are basically inpatient claims. That stands for International Classification of Disease. If you look, look at medical claims now for years, most of my career I dealt with ICD-9s. Now we have an ICD-10, it's a subsequent version. I don't like it myself because it's so doggone convoluted and now they've added thousands of ICDs, but some people like it and some people don't. But I used to know uh, diabetes off the bat used to be 250.0. I knew it right off the bat. I could, intervertebral disc disorder, Hypertension, I could, I could remember all those codes. I can't now because they've changed all those codes, and I'm not a coder, okay? But I had to be aware when I did a lot of the economic, econometric research, I had to access claims data on all these populations, okay? And I had to know and trace these codes because they're not listed in this sequential order for you, okay? It's quite a challenge. So in any event, you see the listings, cancer, otherwise known as neoplasm, and you have basically metabolic, the main one being diabetes, and then a ton of circulatory. And then in addition to the, some other circulatory, you have a couple conditions, musculoskeletal. And so it's really encouraging when you look at these conditions, folks, think about all the people that you work with that are at risk or have these conditions. You see the the golden opportunity you have to mitigate and to impact through your programs and policies and incentives to not only attack these, but also to help people maybe avoid the serious consequences of these conditions. Because these are serious conditions, you know, mental, physical, social, spiritual, the whole gamut. Musculoskeletal, and lastly, anxiety, okay? So there's a couple mental. One thing you'll notice right off the bat, and I'll just say this and quickly move on, you'll see some cancers, for example, if you looked at that original category, colon cancer. And a lot of times we talk about a colorectal cancer, don't we? But the research has been so good over the years that they could not draw a strong relationship between inactivity and rectal cancer, but they could colon cancer. 
And so it's really key, you can begin to see, if I wasn't aware of that, or anybody wasn't aware of that, when we did this cost analysis, if we added rectal cancer in there and took, basically didn't make that division, you see how we pad the numbers, how we hype those numbers up, because now we're including conditions that really have not been demonstrated beyond any reasonable doubt. So these conditions are strongly associated, okay? Not, not modestly, not minor, okay? So that's an important caveat. Now, again, you've seen all kinds of estimates. These are some of the best researchers. I know have most of these guys either uh, with association or, or having worked with them along the years. And some of them represent uh, the CDC, Pratt and D. Eddington, uh, Wang, Nico Pronk, uh, many of you in ACSM are, are familiar with Nico, okay? These guys, Milliman and Robertson, done some of the best research around. So these guys are household names, They've done great work over the years. But even they're going to vary in terms of how much money's, because it's different methodology. But they didn't have the benefit that we have now in the 21st century, because many of these guys began their research back in the 80s and 90s. And we didn't have but about a fourth of the data that we now have. Now we have quite a volume. So again, going back to looking at how do we basically get a handle on the cost and which of those conditions should we really target and factor into equation? Because we don't want to put everything in there. We can't put all these conditions in there. We can only put a select number of that have been demonstrated to have a strong correlation with physical inactivity. So that's real critical. Now, one technique that I actually developed with years ago off my PhD dissertation was a PRFCA. It stands for a proportionate risk factor cost appraisal. I know that's a mouth term, mouth, mouth full. And what that is, is actually a technique that you can prepare in a spreadsheet. And to illustrate this, I have copies of, you can basically, I'm going to advance this one. I brought a copy of, of a, a report, actually it's called an Effective Practice Guideline. I, I was uh, privileged to be asked by the Society for Human Resource Management on a couple of occasions to write an EPG report. It stands for Effective Practice Guidelines, a, a peer-reviewed journal-based uh, uh, report. And I've got copies. I hope I have enough copies for everyone, but please take one. On page 11 of this report, okay, and I've got five or six chapters in there, but on that, it explains how you could take a spreadsheet and by simply, if you look at the top, if you want to study the financial cost or analyze the cost of inactivity on a certain group of conditions, this is the actual data that was generated for New York State nearly 20 years ago because I did a couple projects with New York State. These are actual numbers on the top. Look at the figures there. The millions of claims just for circulatory conditions that were targeted within the scope of being related to inactivity. Look at the total charges that somebody had to pay and so on and so forth. And then the charge that I was given when I was hired to do that was, we don't really care about, at this point, diabetes and obesity. We just really want to highlight inactivity. But in order to do that, I had to tell the sponsor of this, folks, in order to understand physical inactivity, you have to understand all the other risk factors as well, okay? Because many of these risk factors coexist. Like, most people who are inactive are not just inactive, but they have other risk factors as well, don't they, that you work with. You see the great opportunity that you have to be able to make an impact on people when you think about these risk factors, incredible. You're in the right profession, no doubt about it, to be able to make an impact on the quality of human life, but also to help organizations understand why they should be doing what they're doing, to be able to understand the scope and the cost of this, okay? But on page 11 of this report, uh, basically I've illustrated a step-by-step -step process about how you can take an Excel spreadsheet and create your own formulas to study something. But basically, when it was all said and done, we identified almost a billion dollars, if you look at the follow figure, 
from those major risk factors that were associated with, that, with circulatory conditions, we're talking about atherosclerosis here, ischemic heart disease, hypertension, and a number of other coronary atherosclerosis, you know, and a number of other cardiovascular or circulatory conditions. Almost, as you look at the number, $276 million out of almost a billion, a little bit more than 25%, was attributed alone to inactivity in New York State. That's only one out of 10 risk factors, but it accounted for one out of almost every $4, okay? And so in this case, notice also, even though we've got several billion dollars in total charges, we were only able to explain a billion, weren't we? 999 million. And so that tells us that there's other factors beyond these risk factors that drive those charges, okay? So anybody who says, I can, I can fully analyze and understand the full scope of what's driving this? No, it's not possible. If it was, we'd have that right now in 2018, but it's not. There's a lot of other factors that drive medical care costs besides risk factors. But you can see that's a big part of the pie, isn't it? That's a big portion. All right, so page 11. Please pick up one of these. And by the way, if I don't have enough copies, you can simply go online, type in my last name, and basically type in SHRM, S-H-R-M, evaluation, and you can get a PDF online on their website, okay? I just so happen to have some of these copies that have been given out for the last two or three years because I got some comp copies as a result of doing this, but I always like to have a hard copy. But if you, got, you don't get a hard copy, hey, go online, type in my last name, SHRM, S-H-R-M, evaluation, and it'll take you to the PDF itself, okay? About 65 pages, okay? Hopefully this will save you some ink jets, okay? <laughs> All right, using online cost appraisal tools. Two of them I want to highlight, the actual tools. One's called a physical inactivity cost calculator. The other one's called Corporal RX. Let me highlight each, uh, each of the two. Back in 2004-2005, Dr. Bortz and I were privileged enough to be approached by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and San Diego State University on a, on a, on a uh, project that was basically designed to create an online public domain tool, okay, for analyzing or quantifying the cost of inactivity. And the Robert, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is basically the philanthropic role uh, arm of the late Robert Wood Johnson, who was the founder of Johnson & Johnson. Okay, and you know what they're behind trying to really advance the, co the cause of quality of, of life in so many ways. But anyway, Dr. Bortz and I worked closely together with Marla Hollander, and we were primarily instrumental in trying to basically gather a lot of the data, and we were the architects, okay? And if you go online, which we will in a few minutes, you'll see Dr. Bortz's name, my name, Marla Hollander, and a few others. But more importantly, we basically developed the cost calculator at that time. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation kept it on the website for one year before they shifted from inactivity to pediatric or childhood obesity. And so then they really shifted heavily for good reason. And so Robert Wood Johnson Foundation gave me, as the chief economist there, gave me permission, gave me the rights, and I extended it to the university, uh, East Carolina University, where I was on the faculty at the time during my 31 year career. Before I retired, I was able to get it online and that's where it currently exists, okay? so. In that vein, whoops, let me back up here. The nationwide average medical cost, when we looked at that time, was based on seven states, not the nine, because I hadn't done the two other states at that time. It represented about 72 million adults in those states. So, pretty big number in a database, okay? It included a, a little bit of data on workers' comp, because at that time, a couple of the states had workers' comp data, okay? 
And also, when you look at the, the focus of it, there was a, the lost productivity. The lost productivity at that point in time was primarily limited just to absenteeism and presenteeism. We didn't have a lot of good data on short-term disability quite yet. It's only been in the last decade that we had enough on STDs that we could capitalize and build it into uh, the newer tool called Corporal RX that I'll get to in a minute. And then the, there was obviously, like any tool or resource, there's some limitations. Number one, this is only designed for adults because it's predicated on medical care conditions, okay, and not pediatric conditions, okay, and medical care claims, okay. And even though we know that inactive children can develop some of these conditions and do, we just don't have a lot of medical claims on 15-year-olds versus 50-year-olds, okay. So again, to make it representative, to have the validity and the credibility that it's got to have, we've got to make sure that the database matches the population that we're trying to measure and focus on. The other thing, the focus is, is only on morbidity, meaning illness. It doesn't really trace and track the cost of years lost, okay, or mortality. It does not do that, okay. And lastly, you can see here, it doesn't, it doesn't factor in the condition for the weekend warrior that goes out and basically bust an ankle trying to sprint or run a, a 5K for the first time. It doesn't factor those costs in. So there's some limitations. But everything has limitations. Just to go to show you some of the data that goes back into this, Dr. Bortz and I had to really look at, in terms of building that database, that since medical care costs were a lot of the, the common denominator in this case, we had to really try to, as best as we could, segmentize and, uh, and determine uh, if we wanted some sensitivity in any kind of tool, we don't necessarily treat all 50 states the same because all 50 states vary, each one of them, in terms of the medical care cost because the medical care cost in the north differs di different from state to state, definitely differs from the south, east, west, and so on. So we had regional. And you see some numbers to the left-hand side, like 1.05 and, and, and maybe a, a, a 0.92 or, or 0.94. That, that basically is an indicator. Anything above 1.0 was basically considered to be above average. Anything below 1.0 was below. And again, that's just some of the example, one of many examples where we build in so much sensitivity because we wanted this tool to be geographic focused, meaning at the state level, not treating all 50 states the same. In order to do that, we had to do a lot of research at the state level, okay, on medical care, okay. Now, using a PI cost calculator, this is the website, okay? If you want to write that down, just as a backup, let me read it off, okay? It's www2, the number two, dot ecu, which stands for East Carolina University, dot edu, backslash hhp, which stands for Health and Human Performance, that was the college that the department is in, backslash PI cost calc, backslash. Please read that, read, either take a photo of that or basically write it down so that way you'll have that as a future reference, okay? And there's a number of website links, okay, on there. Background facts and figures, you'll see the literature review, you'll see a lot of the sponsors, you'll see um, the scientific methodology, which I think is 18 pages long, okay? So it's a very good uh, website in a sense that it provides you a lot of background information for those of you that want to study the methodology, okay? Now the other one that is basically was released in late 2016 in addition to is called Corp Well, 
rx. And that's at www.corpwellrx.com. And again, it has a number of links that we'll access in a minute. That one was basically designed primarily on for organizations like employers and in individuals that work with business and industry. Unlike the PI cost calc, that was a more ger germane, more population-wide tool designed to apply for just about anybody at, that was a young adult and an older adult, okay? The Corporal RX was based not only on that database, but really heavily focused on employee health care claims, medical claims. It was also more heavily focused on employee absenteeism, presenteeism, short-term disability, okay? And so if you work in an organization or if you're doing some type of cost analysis that involve employees, the Corporal RX is designed specifically for that purpose, okay? And you'll see the differences when you look at the platform. Okay, basically has, again, a number of website links right there on the home page, okay? Now, on that, it quantifies 15 major risk factors, not just inactivity, but 14 others, okay? In addition, it looks at if you basically have a program or policy in place and you say, I wonder how that basically turned out. For X number of dollars we put into this activity program, what does it look like from a benefit cost standpoint? What was the benefits of that? So again, if factors in, some of the data that you can put in, it's a little bit more of a rigorous data input process you'll see, but it also gives you some impact data in terms of current uh, interventions. And lastly, the thing that I was most excited about when I started embarking on this, and I've been involved with this stuff for, for about 35 years, but only in the last two or three years, as I was getting into the twilight of my career, I said, how can I basically take all that I have here and all my connections and parlay that into the last thing that I develop as a product or tool, okay, in my career, okay? And so, if you can imagine, what I wanted to do is do something that basically centered around the pivotal question that I heard time and time again. Many times I'd work with business and industry, and I said, Dave, we want, th we want to really know three things. What are our cost drivers in terms of risk factors? What are our leading cost drivers? Second of all, if we're doing some things, we'd like to have some, some feedback on whether or not we're work it's working or not. Because we don't want to have another consultant come in and do a cost analysis and another one do a benefit cost analysis. And then thirdly, the last one, we don't want to charge a third time for some fancy group to come in and do a break-even analysis. The break-even forecast, meaning this indicates how many people in a given population with the condition basically would need to, at, uh, at risk, would either need to minimize or eliminate that risk factor to offset the cost of that condition, okay? So those are the three things. That's kind of a three-in-one. Like I say, these conditions had to meet certain criteria because, you know, there's hundreds of risk factors. But here's the criteria that we had basically to hold them up against. Number one, they had to be costly to business and industry, to the employer. They had to have a cost, a medical care cost and a lost productivity cost. That's one. Second of all, they had to be potentially modifiable, okay, or have some degree of potential modifiability. Third of all, they had to have some kind of amenability to a program or policy or an incentive, meaning we could do something to help, not necessarily reverse that condition, but manage that condition, okay? And then the other thing, we had to have a lot of data literature on those things. Those were the four factors. And those, those risk factors right there, we now have, they meet those four criteria. They didn't meet them 15 years ago. Did not meet them. Only in the last 10 to 15 years were we able to add a few of those risk factors. 
we also realize that the world just doesn't center around physical activity, does it? We'd like to think it does, but there's other games to the, in, in the mix of things, isn't there? You can find people that are physically active, but if, that, if they're dealing with migraines, you know, if they got asthma or hypertension, that's a big deal. So we got to look at the holism or the totality of that health status, not just one risk factor. Anyway, to give you an idea, we tapped in hundreds of research studies. Not tens, but hundreds. And then lastly, this particular tool factored in sensitivity factors like the actual number of a workforce, the age distribution by decade, in other words, 21-year-olds to 30-year-olds and 31-year-olds to 40-year-olds and so on. It looked at the type of work site, the location of the work site, okay? It also looked at the employee compensation. So if somebody's absent because of a migraine, what's that cost that employer if that person's out? We would have to know that compensation in terms of salary and benefits, wouldn't we? Most tools did not approach that. You can see we weren't prepared to deal with that detail and what we call that sensitivity until just the last few years. We didn't have it prior to the 21st century, which we did, but we didn't. Also looking at the medical cost trend in the company, okay? Looking at risk factor rates. And of course, lastly, how much money is a worksite spending to try to prevent or mitigate some of those risk factors. So you can begin to see this is a lot of, this is much more robust than what had ever been published. And that's why it took a, about two years to develop. It was a, a very arduous process to say, say the least. Okay, so therefore, you can see some of the, per, uh, the journals that we tapped from. Best in around. You know, we didn't go to, to non-peer review, everything that was published had to be out of a, or used in our database had to be peer reviewed. Is it perfect? No. Nothing perfect about research. Always imperfections, always margin of errors. Okay? Just like life. You know, it's all relative. But we try to minimize that margin of error by having a lot of research. Okay? You can look at the, basically, a lot of research that uh, we've done generate a lot of database. And then lastly, when we look at lost productivity, we looked at uh, literally since 1999, in the last 20 years, there's been a lot published in lost productivity. That gave us the confidence and trust to be able to do something here. Prior to that time, we didn't have it. So when it's all said and done, uh, what basically is Corporal Rx? It's an online tool, online calculator, a template on your screen that you can access by any personal smartphone or computer, desktop, laptop, whatever. As long as you can get access to an online, you can basically get access and utilize it on the screen. Type of industry. It has data windows that you're asked to basically specify the type of industry. Okay. Okay. That's real important. The state location, number of employees by age group, risk factor prevalence. Prevalence change, in other words, in the last year, what kind of change in prevalence did these people with hypertension have last year to this year? Yes? What if you don't have all of the data? Can it still generate a report if you're missing something? It does. It sure does. Excellent point. Most, most work sites are not going to focus on 15 risk factors. And so we've made adjustments for the fact if there's just one, they can do a, fo a single or a multiple risk factor or all 15. So we built that in. Yeah. Because I've never worked with a company in my life that, that had programs and interventions designed for all 15. So we know that up front. Yeah. Yeah. Employee compensation. So you can, a company's medical care inflation and the wellness budget. And lastly, the projected size of the workforce going forth. You can begin to see that this requires whoever's going to use Corporal RX. If you want a rigorous outcome, you got to spend a few minutes 
and taking care of it. Whatever you get out, you put into it. It's kind of a real direct correlation there. So, the scope of that, if you do not have, you know, all of those risk factors targeted, okay, and you don't set aside a certain part of your budget, and that's 99.9% .9 of all organizations don't have either one of those, then that's why we designed a user guide, an elaborate user guide, step by step. So if you only want to ta tackle four risk factors or five risk factors or one, okay, how would you go about that in a tool like this? And the user guide is designed to address that, okay? Now, speaking of that, most of you are involved with some kind of physical activity programs, and we know physical activity, once you get people physically active, it helps address other risk factors, doesn't it? Whole host of them. Everything from the mental health to the blood pressure to A1C, da 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 da, down the line. So, in this case, it's important that when you, if you're going to use Corporal RX, I can't encourage you strongly enough to read the user guide first. It'll be the best 10 or 15 minutes primer that anybody can give to you, besides me walking you through it, okay? That's the next best thing, okay? Tailoring corporeal around selected risk factors. So, the industry type and state and number of employees, for example, if we take example, it just has a data window. If we had a manufacturing company in Indiana and that was their breakdown, those would be three data set windows. And they're just drop down windows or their data input windows. So we would know, need to know what kind of company we're focusing on. We would need to know what state or location. Again, we've got to get that regional and that statewide sensitivity. And thirdly, the reason why we want to know the number of employees by age group, think about this. A 21-year-old doesn't make the money that a 51-year-old makes. There's a lot of variation in wage and salary, and sometimes in benefits. So we actually ask for that breakdown on a decade-by-decade de decade basis okay, to build that sensitivity in. Very critical, because if we're going to cost out absenteeism and presenteeism and short-term disability, but especially absenteeism and presenteeism, doesn't it make sense that we, we would want to know what that person is making if he or she is on the job or if they're losing time while they're on a the job due to this condition? Certainly. We can't go forth with any confidence without that. So, when we look at risk factors, one of the, the, on, the on the actual Corporal RX calculator looks something like this. It has three data sets or three data columns. The first column aside from the risk factors listed, is to ask you to basically put in the percentage of employees that you know have that condition or that you suspect. And if you don't know, we actually have a listing on the actual, cal actual calculator that gives you the national norm. So if you don't want to use something, you don't have it, and you just want to play around with it and just say, ah, I think our employees are fairly typical, okay, then it gives you a national norm in addition to that. But you can begin to see the more definitive information you have, the better the accuracy or the validity of this tool is going to be, the more trust and confidence. The next thing is basically the annual percentage change. And again, you're probably not tracking 15 risk factors. You might be tracking three or four. And so you would put in, has the percentage of that risk factor gone down 1%? If so, you would basically type in, a minus one, and it does all the work behind you. And lastly, what percentage of the budget do I allocate towards that risk factor? Okay, and again, most work sites are not going to have a focus on all 15, or they're going to dedicate. So, in this case, since we're talking about inactivity, we would put those numbers in, whatever those figures are, and that would basically be the three column data windows that, that we would be, and if you didn't have anything, you just put a zero, okay? You don't want to make anything up, uh, you know, just to look, make it look good or look bad, you know, it, when in doubt, make sure that you think about the credibility and the trust that you have here. The other data windows that 
basically are on the website. Just simply ask average annual compensation. Okay, so if we take basically, we just type in, you could basically check in with your HR manager, your benefits manager, your, your chief comptroller, or somebody in your company probably knows this off the top of the head. It said our average employee compensation, our salary, and our benefits, normally it's a, about a four to one ratio. The average American makes $42,000 a year, and they have about eight to $10,000 of benefits. So their compensation is somewhere around 50, 52, 53,000. That's on average, but it varies considerably from site to site, state to state, to state industry to industry. The other thing they're gonna ask you to, what was the last, over the last few years, what was the average annual cost of healthcare in your company? Was it 5%, 9%, 15% of what? And the thing in your user guide, it basically lists in your user guide people in an organization that you can tap into or that are likely to know this, like people that are a benefits manager, an HR manager, a risk manager, okay, <coughs> personnel. The other thing is your total wellness budget that you would know or should know, shouldn't you? You know, how much money you're spending. And lastly, what kind of workforce change and numbers of people do you anticipate in your workforce next year? This is critical because when we make a break-even analysis, that projection or that prescription, we need to know what number of people are going to basically be on your payroll now and versus next year. So when we make that projection, okay, we have that, we have that information. So once you're on there, you basically hit the calculate button. There's a blue calculate button. After you type in all that data, these are just data cells. Okay, they're on a single screen. You don't have to go from screen to screen to screen to screen and drive yourself crazy. They're on a single screen. And in this case, you want something, obviously, the outcome is going to be several, a couple tables and a couple graphs on the same screen. Everything's on one screen, okay? Try to make it simple and, and straightforward. It's also going to list risk factor cost rankings. It's going to list it in rank highest to lowest. Okay, whoops, I keep hitting that, I'm sorry. Benefit cost ranking, industry benefit, break even prescription. It's going to list all these things, okay? Now this is going to be, this is probably overwhelming for you to try to figure out how is all this information on a single screen? And I would agree with you, it's pretty intimidating when you think about trying to pull all this thing together. That's why we want to take a look at the actual one. The other thing, that I'm excited about Corporal RX because I, if I heard it once, I heard it a hundred times. Dave, how many people with this risk factor that we currently have do we need to impact in order for us to really offset our cost? Not only the budget, the allocation of money that we're spending, but also the medical care costs associated, the lost productivity costs. How could we basically keep our costs contained? and still justify spending this amount of money. So you would have a what if, what if? You know, I had, for example, back pain. Every company has back pain, folks, young and old. Every one of them. Some of them have more than others. Let's just say we had 15% prevalence rate and we chose to spend a small percentage, in this case, 3%, and we thought we could drop that down from 15% to 14%, a what if scenario. On the other hand, listen, what if we bumped it up from 3% to 4%, maybe we can get 1.5% drop. But let's not stop there. We had a pretty good year, so let's go ahead and bump up the percentage of our allocation one more percentage. So in this case, we're going to throw 5% of the budget towards back pain, thinking we can drop down from 15 to 15 to 12.5% or 2.5% drop. What would we do? We hit the calculate button, and lo and behold, it actually lists the number of people that currently have back pain that you would need to get into that back pain intervention to offset the costs that you're putting into that program and the anticipated future costs of back pain. That's a ba basically a break-even. It would list the number of individuals. 
Think about that. That's a prescription. Okay? So, when you look at that, what do we get when we hit that calculate button? The first thing on the right-hand side, you get a table that looks like this. An aggregate of all 15 or 5, how many number of risk factors you have data on, it will basically give you the current cost. And then it will basically inflate that cost at their medical care rate inflation. And it'll give you a nice, simple bar chart. You see how simple that is? Okay. I know it's not incredible, folks. But people are so overwhelmed now with data analytics, including me, that their head is spinning. You've ever heard of the thing, overanalysis leads to paralysis? So true. It's like ESPN and the first inning, the second batter is up there, and they got this little footnote down there. So-and-so's up to bat, and he's got a 3-2 count, and it's in the first inning. Mm. I'm thinking, what is the value of telling me that this ball player has a 3-2 count or just hit a double in the first inning? It's a nine-inning game. I don't really care what goes on in the first inning. It's the bottom line that counts, isn't it? This is the bottom line, folks. Bottom line. People want something quick, fast, and to the point, don't they? Okay. So, the other thing they actually have below that bar chart, they have all the numbers below listed in this table. They have the medical care and lost productivity cost for each of the risk factors. They had the benefit cost ratio based upon the data that you gave on your program intervention. If you did something and you said, I impacted this number of people and I spent this amount of money to get it, this is the benefit cost ratio. Okay? They compare that against an industry norm, which has never been published. And I, if I was 25 or 30, I probably, starting a career, I probably would have such a thin skin. I probably would have not taken the chance of saying, I'm going to publish an industry norm. I'm 65 now. My career's behind me. I, I got such a thick skin. I'm not worried about it because I've had a good run. And I think my record will speak for itself when it's all said and done. Won't it, Dr. Bortz? His record. Comment? Yes. you can do something about it. A lot of things are faded. Medicine is behavior, so it is changeable. So whenever you're going to change something, the thing that's dominant is how much is it going to cost. So until we have those numbers, everything else is kind of fantasy. It's good for you. And they talk, I give talks all the time, and the word that I'm challenged with is wishful. Well, what do you do with wishful? Wishful what lends itself to cost benefit. And David's doing that, leading the charge. And this is just the first part. Where this takes us to a national level is incredible. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Walter. Thank you for giving this I'm, I'm just riding the coattails. You, you, ride, you have to ride certain coattails in your career to be successful. And I don't say that to patronize that man. But that's honest to God's truth. And I think you'll know the success you get in your own career, you have to surround yourself with great people because you're only as good as the people that you work with. I'm going to wrap this up, and then we're going to move right to the calculators because I, I want to be sensitive to time. These are just basically some of the outcomes that you'll see. Benefit-cost ratio, these are the data outcomes on the page, okay? This is what you'll see illustrated. Okay, so I'm going to basically go through this, get through this, because I really want to show you while we take a moment, take a stretch break and let me access the online tools. Come up and get a copy.
Hey, thank you, Walter. Where is Well Point? Well Point. Where are they? You know, I'd have to look at where they're at right now. Come on now. <coughs> and somebody with good eyes, I got my contacts in. Can you come up here, young man? Because you look like you have 2020 vision. I want to type in this website right here. Can you see if there's anything in there? I must, I may be off a digit or two. There we go. Thank you. Okay. This right here, this is the PI cost calc. Five steps. You can go online. We don't have time to go online for all the websites, but you can basically read about the, the background, the methodology and so on, because each one of these links that I highlighted right here is what I'm looking at. Let's take me to the calculator. That's really what the most important thing is right here. Okay, so we take go to the calculator. Let me expand that. And that's the face page. Now this is small, and I'm, I don't know why it is so small, but let me just explain or illustrate. The first one is select your state, okay? These are just pull down windows, all right? Very quick. S scroll down a particular state. That's California, for example, okay? Then it lists the number, number of adults, okay? I type in the number of adults. I'm just going to fictitiously type in a number. It's about 13 and a half million. Actually, it's about, uh, Walter, what, about 20, 22, 23 million adults out in California now? 22. 22. All right. I'm just going to type in a number just to illustrate. Whatever the number is, you type in. I'm just going to use 22000000. Oh, too many zeros there. Okay. And then the number of adults, basically, that are working, okay? So this would be appropriate if you're, if you're looking at um, a business or industry or working adults in a community. And then you just type in the number 23456. I'm just going to type in 7. I'm just going to type in. Then you hit the next step. Those are the first three steps. The next one is a percentage of individuals 65 and older, okay? And so this captures the aging population or the senior citizens or baby boomers like me, okay? So the national norm is 15%. That's the national, that's the, the, the norm. Then we would type in the percentage of that population that is physically inactive, okay? I'm just going to leave that figure as a default. But the national average is about 50%, okay? The last thing, last of this step, is type in the annual wage and compensation. The salary and benefits, the average in America is about 50,000. That's benefits included. That's not the annual wage, okay? And so if I type in here, 50000, I just hit the calculate button, these six steps. You can see this is so close. Now, and I wish this would show up a little bit further. On your laptop and, and your screen, you're going to see it more vividly. 
it will list your medical care cost, workers' comp cost, lost productivity cost, and then the total cost. The other thing that I was excited to be able to do with Dr. Bortz and Marla as a result of this, we did factor in if only one out of 20 people, 5%, that are inactive, move to activity, what kind of cost savings could we enjoy? And it lists the cost avoidance. And that's very conservative, folks. To me, if, if I couldn't make a 5% impact, I'd have to get out of a business, okay? Because I think I can make 10, 15% impact, okay? Especially on activity, just to get people walking. We're not talking about running 5Ks here, okay? So that's, that is, and you can print the results and so on. That's the PI cost calc, six steps. You can see how, how it was developed by reading some of the background information. Now, let me go back. Since we're running out of time, I want to be sensitive to that. Let's just simply go to um, Corpwell RX. Can you type in CorpwellRx.com for me? Because these contacts can see great distance, but they can't see up close. CorpwellRx.com. C O R P. W E L L. Yeah. Dot com. Corpwell. R X. Dot com. That's it right there. Thank you. I appreciate your great eyes. I wish I had them. I wouldn't wear contacts. Okay. You see, here's who we are. It's got a demo by YouTube. The user guide I spoke of. Critical, absolutely critical. But it's very explicit. I can't tell you how many edits we had on that thing to get it right. Here's the calculator. This is the baby right here. Look right what you see. You see all the data windows on the left. Okay, all the data windows on the left. You choose the industry, you choose the state, and then you basically fill in down below, you see the number of employees by age group, and then you scroll down, and again you can see the national norms are listed here. Any of those fa figures that, or any of those risk factors that you don't want to basically input, you just put a zero, and it'll kick those out. All right. Last four, as you can see, the data fields down there. The um, annual employee compensation, medical care costs, total program budget, and the overall workforce change. Once I get my data in those, I just simply go up and hit calculate, bingo. All my data outputs. One page. Let's, you can highlight them right there. Project the risk factor cost. There's your table. And the table is broken out from here in bar charts. Annual cost per risk factor, highest to lowest. Benefit cost ratio. Industry norms. And so I would basically say, when you look at this right here, if you see some areas in purple, you can say, I shouldn't have things in purple. I need to move them. Because down below, it indicates the industry norm for good programs. They should be positive, not negative. So that, I take that as a challenge, okay? And then the last thing, the prescription that people just love about this, it indicates the number of individuals at risk that you would need to engage to make an impact. So when you're strategizing, say you had a smoking cessation, only one out of five people in a smoking cessation basically quit smoking. So if I needed 20 indicated here, what number of people would I need to get into my smoking cessation program? 100, wouldn't I? So it gives you opportunities. 
That in a nutshell, again, play around with it. You can reach me. Once you play around with it, feel free to just simply contact. You can, in fact, let me give you, that's my email right there. Feel free to give me an email anytime and I can walk you through this if you've got a question on that because a, a, a session like this doesn't give me enough time to cover it. But I hope these two tools now give you an op opportunity to now access some things that you can really get your teeth into. All right? I wish you very well. Take care.